Hi, so today's lesson is about introductions and conclusions. We have to begin and end our speeches effectively. If you think about it, beginnings are your first impression. And it is really hard to change first impressions. It can be done. But if you start solid, both in helping us know what we need to listen for and exude confidence and project that you're prepared, that you're in control, that's going to set the tone for the whole speech. And if you end with that same confidence and a review and a solid sense of closure, we'll forgive you some things in the middle. So really thinking about that beginning and ending is super important. Remember, that's the tell me what you're going to tell me and the tell me what you told me. Uh, I will say rule of thumb, experience, kids typically over practice their intro and they ignore their conclusion and they just hope for the best and it leads to some very awkward finishes and people don't know you're done and uh, it's not the last impression you want to leave with an audience nor the person who's then going to look at the sheet and write a grade down. So when we get done with today's notes, um, you should be able to describe the purpose of introductions and conclusions. You should be able to talk about effective introductory techniques and effective conclusions. So that's the purpose of today. <clears throat> so, two most important parts. Three purposes for your introduction. It's to gain our attention. So you should have that strong attention getter that makes us want to sit up and listen. Um, there's also kind of the second part of the attention getter is that common ground I talked about yesterday. Why do I want to listen? Why do I need to know anything about um, color crayons? I give an informative speech on the history of color crayons. Why do I, as an audience member, want to listen? How do you help me want to listen? Um, let the audience know what the speech will be about. That's your background. That's your super clear thesis statement. In speech, different from writing, we are going to be very explicit with our thesis statements. Um, in a paper, you would never say, in this paper, I will argue, I will inform. You'll make your English teachers freak out. But in a speech, it's okay to say something like, today we will explore the three phases of the development of color crayons the early years, the middle years, and the ma modern era. Very direct. I know now in the body, I'm going to have a paragraph about the early years of color crayons, the middle years of color crayons, and the modern era of color crayons. And then my conclusion is going to sum it all up. <clears throat> How do we gain people's attention? These are very much like <clears throat> when we write. We tell stories or anecdotes, and this is a particularly important one in persuasive speaking. You need to make it relatable to your, <clears throat> um, sorry, I wasn't happy where that was. You need to make it relatable. Uh, that's how we get that emotional connection, by telling the story. Maybe that is our attention getter, why something was invented, was an interesting story. <clears throat> the shock and awe, startling statement, um, facts, statistics, um, quotes, claims by people, those get our attention. A quotation that's relevant to your speech and that you've tied in and are going to come back to. <clears throat> um, humor, except I don't really recommend humor. Humor's really, really hard. You might be the funniest person at your lunch table, but that's not going to translate as the funniest person in front of the room. Um, humor is super hard to deliver. It often offends instead of uniting audiences. And it's often not situationally appropriate. If you're giving a serious speech persuading us to wear sunscreen to prevent skin cancer, starting with a joke is not appropriate. So even though it's an effective attention getter, it's not one I would recommend because it takes far more skill to deliver a joke to 30 people in a room than it does to make a funny at the lunch table. Uh, a demonstration, that works for your demo speeches if you want to illustrate a magic trick 
or show us the finished product, uh, that is that sales pitchy demonstration technique. Um, that common ground could be your attention getter, uh, asking a rhetorical question or gaining the audience to think of with something, you know, think about something with you. Um, you can start with a personal experience. If you're comfortable, uh, it certainly isn't something you have to tell family secrets or share your you know, innermost fears. Uh, I had a fabulous speech in college speech one year about a student who started with how skin cancer had affected her family and why this was such an important topic. And she was comfortable sharing that. It was a very dynamic and powerful introduction. Statistics can fall under that shock and awe and then rhetorical questions and really want to emphasize rhetorical you never want to ask a question and then elicit audience response and have your next answer be based on the audience response because a you can't count on the audience response and you can't know what they're going to say so for example you're going to ask the audience a question how many of you have ever texted and drove you know text and drive and you think the majority of kids are going to raise their hand. So your next line is, now that most of you admit to this, let me tell you the dangers. But if no one raises their hand, your next line doesn't work. And now 12 seconds into your speech, you've crashed and burned. So it's okay to ask rhetorical questions. Have you ever considered? Have you ever thought about? How many of you have experienced? But don't ever ask for a response because you can't control it. So conclusions, is it over yet? Uh, you might be thinking that, you don't ever want your audience to think that, you want them to be wanting more, but you have to signal that the end is coming. The worst thing that happens in public speaking is uh, a speaker is going and then they stop and nobody, uh, oh, they're done and we know it's time to clap. So you want to signal both through that strong summary through some sort of a, a, a statement that gives us a sense of closure. You always restate your thesis, okay? Um, and if you started with a statistic, maybe you close with it. If you started with a story or a question, you close with it. We should hear in your voice that your voice slows and goes down, right? You signal to us non-verbally and you bring your voice down and you slow. Uh, we should hear that sense of closure in your voice and in your words. Your conclusion is important because it's what we hear last and it's what we remember. It's the last thing in our brain. We should sum it up and it tells us when to applaud. So you always give a summary. Tell me what you told me. Give some sort of appeal or dramatic statement. That's your call to action for persuasive. That is that opening statement that you're bringing back. You can come back to a quotation, either the same one or a matching one from the beginning. That's that tying that intro and conclusion together. So that is our summary of intros and conclusions. And every speech that you'll have, you'll have to consider your intro and your conclusion when you're writing your speeches. Honestly, they're the last things I write because you don't really know what your speech is going to say until you've written the body. The hook, that attention getter, those are the very last things I write in a speech. You need to do all your research first, but they are things you need to give thoughtful consideration to when you're writing your speech if you want your speech to be effective. See you tomorrow.